Welcome everyone. On behalf of the International Bipolar Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar with Dr. Jennifer Barr. Today, Dr. Barr will share her story of personal transformation from early struggles leading to a diagnosis of bipolar disorder to living mentally well. She will provide a unique perspective that is rarely found in this field as both a patient and a provider with experience in both the conventional and natural fields of medicine. Through shared sharing of her lived experience, she provides hope to those recently diagnosed or struggling for recovery that you can live very well with bipolar disorder. The focus today will be on her story, but will include some information on general natural therapies that can be employed to get better results from any treatment method used. Dr. Barr received her doctorate of naturopathic medicine from Southwest College in Tempe, Arizona, where she focused her clinical studies on homeopathy and pediatrics. She was drawn to this because of personal and family struggles with mood and anxiety disorders, most of which found their beginnings in childhood. She has seen firsthand the effects of delayed or suppressive treatments of childhood conditions as they progress into adulthood. She saw friends and family members struggle through all stages of life until they were forced to take powerful medicines that controlled moods and anxiety, but dulled their personality. She witnessed the battle between wanting to control moods and desire to avoid the harsh side effects of medications, which led her to naturopathic medicine in search of a better way. She believes that she found that way and has dedicated her practice to treating mood disorders as well as children and adolescents to help prevent them from experiencing adult mental illness and lead happy, productive lives. Welcome, Dr. Barr. Thank you, and thank everybody for uh, joining me this morning. I know it's a bit of an early morning for me at least. Um, I don't know how where everybody all is right now. So um, before I get started, I just want to say that I'm basically using the PowerPoint here to keep me on track. This is not really a rehearsed presentation. Um, it's my story, and I feel that my story is more valuable when I just share instead of trying to really, really rehearse it. Um, that being said, I'm also typically a very active presenter, a very um, motions-oriented kind of presenter, so it's a little bit unusual for me to be talking to a computer screen, so please bear with me as I adjust to that as well. Um, I'm going to be sharing a bit about my story, and then like the presenter said, or the, the introduction said, I'm going to be sharing some of a bit of tips on things that you can do, or things that I do, um, and things that I find work for a lot of my patients. Um, and I'm going to try to leave a good amount of time for questions. So like I said, since this is not a super rehearsed or extraordinarily planned out, um, other than my story, uh, presentation, there may be more time than, than um typical for questions, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so basically, I get it. Trust me. I really I really do get it. That sinking feeling when you're first diagnosed, I remember that so clearly. Um, I really do get it. That second blow being told that what you thought was you at your best was really a symptom that you're ill and will be for the rest of your life. Oh, yes, I do get it. Those struggles to maintain functionality in your brain, in your life, and in your relationships. And I get it because I lived it. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to help people feel a little bit of hope um, that not only can you live well with, the, with a diagnosis of mental illness, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a terrible, um, lifelong um, affliction, but that you can recover from it. Um, when I first talked to the International Bipolar Foundation, um, I was sharing a little bit about my story, and that's why we decided to do this webinar, is because there's a lot of information that's given for people about um, how to go about with medications and how to, to use coping skills, various different things, but there's not as much information about really about people um, recovering and really truly living well, at least not so far in the, the webinar series here has not been as much of that. So I hope that I'm able to do that for you today. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you about my, my story. I'm also going to share with you where I've come to in, that, um, in my story overall, and that's led me to a, a good amount of activism, which is one of the main reasons that I'm here with you today. I'm going to give you a little bit of a different look at medicine. Um, what was being said earlier was that 
Um, I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I'll give you a little bit more information about that because there's a decent chance that a lot of you don't know what that is. Um, I didn't know what a naturopathic doctor was um, probably about seven years ago before I decided to start um, going down this path, but we'll get more into that because that is definitely a big part of my story. And then I want to give you some take-home tips for effective treatment just to make sure that no matter what type of treatment you choose to use, um, that you can get the best um, efficacy from it. So let's start with my story. Um, the worst time that I had um, happened to be at the time when I was both in the Navy and at the University of Maryland. I was a very, very active person. Um, I was studying my undergrad, which was physiology and neurobiology at the University of Maryland. Needless to say, that's not a very easy course of study. I was also active duty in the United States Navy, where my job happened to be as an Arabic translator. I was it was, this was back in 2002, 2003. I was in the Navy from 1998 until 2004, and I was going to the University of Maryland until, the, until 2004 as well. So if you recall, during that time, we were fighting Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, both of which involved Arabic-speaking peoples, and I happened to work at the Office of Counterterrorism at the National Security Agency. So I was a very, very busy girl. I um, went to school during the day, and was taking a full course load and then went to work at night where I was busy, you know, chasing terrorists, basically. Um, it was a, a very challenging time. I had a lot of ups and downs. There were times when I would uh, just not feel so great, be a lot more sluggish, less responsive, um, feel, feeling pretty down, but in the military, you've got a culture of hide it, hide it, hide it. you got to tough it up and drive on. So I did that, and nobody seemed to pick up on that. They just assumed that it was the weight of everything that I was doing that was getting to me. There were other times that I was incredibly active and had excessive amounts of energy, really playful. Um, and at one point, I even went on a shopping spree and brought in over $500 worth of children's toys into the offices at the NSA, and nobody seemed to notice that there was anything potentially wrong. Um, I, they just attributed it to I'd had too much coffee to try to get me through my day um, with all of the work that I had to do. It finally got to a point where I felt completely overwhelmed. It was in November 2003, and I was feeling so incredibly depressed. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't be awake without thinking of ending it all. I am, in particular, I... I couldn't stop thinking about suicide with drowning. That was the only method that I really had available to me. It had been a really, really, really tough semester. Things had continued to get worse with my rotating shifts, which didn't help my condition in, in any way, um, working really late nights, long hours, um, dealing with some very difficult stuff at work, too. And it just reached the point that I, I couldn't stop um, thinking about dying. So I was just taking medication, um, over-the-counter sleeping pills to basically sleep my way through the day so that I would stop thinking. Um, it was it did help somewhat. Um, I, that half lasted for about four days, and it reached to the point that one night I um, wasn't intentionally trying to commit suicide necessarily, but I did take an extra amount of sleeping pills and went to bed with the comfort of thinking that Maybe the alcohol I'd had during that day when the sleeping pills weren't working to keep me, my thoughts from, from going out of control, um, that maybe that alcohol plus the sleeping pills might prove to be lethal, and I might actually not wake up the next morning. I did wake up, and when I felt sad that, or disappointed that I woke up, that's when I knew that I needed to get help. So that day I called the... Um, Naval, Bethesda, Naval Medical Center at Bethesda, which is where I saw my doctors. Um, I was fortunate because that's a really good hospital. Um, and I told them that I needed to make an appointment with behavioral health, which is a huge deal for somebody in the military and especially somebody with a security clearance. There's rumors left and right that if you have a security clearance and you have to go to mental health, that you will lose your job. And I had reached a point of such desperation because I knew that I didn't have what felt like the courage to kill myself at that time, 
but I also didn't have the strength to continue living the way that I had been. Um, it was impossible. I, I couldn't function. And so I needed to get help. And it, if it meant that I lost my job, then that was the, that was really the only choice that I had because I couldn't continue to do my job as I was feeling and, and I couldn't continue to live as I was feeling. So I, I swallowed my pride and I called and I asked for an appointment and the routine there typically in the military and in the VA, you don't get in to see a doctor pretty quickly, especially with mental health because we're so overburdened in the military and in the VA with mental health services. Um, as I'm sure most people know, they've heard it. It's a pretty big news um, r routinely. And what happened for me is I called them and I said I needed to get, make an appointment, and they asked me immediately, as they should, if I had a, ever had any thoughts of hurting myself. And I answered, yes, I have. Then they asked me when the last time that happened to be, and I said it was last night. And they immediately encouraged me to go to the emergency room, and I happen to be a very stubborn person, so I managed to not get to the emergency room. I, I stood my ground and I said, no, I don't need to go to the emergency room. I just need an appointment. And because of that, I'm certain, is why I was able to get in to see my doctor the very next day. Um, I was anticipating getting some medications, antidepressants. Um, and fortunately for me, he was able to spend a significant amount of time with me because he was in the military, not constrained by um, anything other than his schedule, and it wasn't overwhelmed for that day for some reason. Or, the, you know, with the military, it's hurry up and wait. So they don't have any problem keeping people waiting to make sure that things are taken care of, which in that regard, it's really good that that's the, the culture there. So he spent probably an hour and a half or more with me, um, did a thorough differential diagnosis. He didn't just take my word for it that I was depressed and I needed an antidepressant. Um, he asked me lots of questions about, um, have I ever had racing thoughts? Well, yes, of course I have. Have I ever been told that I talk too fast? Well, yeah. Have you ever had goal-directed activities or been really, really full of energy? And I thought through it and I was like, well, yeah, but those, that's just me when I'm feeling my best. That's just, that's normal. That's how I am. And he continued on, have you ever spent significant amount of money and when you then regretted it or had any type of reckless behavior that was out of the norm for you? And as I go through, I'm recounting a couple of different times. I'm like, well, yeah, but it was like this and that's not really that big of a deal. And um, he continued his assessment and then finally told me, you actually have bipolar disorder. And that was a really, really tough thing to hear, like I said in the beginning, to be told that these things, when I, I just articulated to him again and again, that's when I feel my best. That's just me. Um, he told me that me at my best was not really me at my best, that that was an illness. And that was um, much harder to swallow than even the fact that I called to, to make this appointment in a culture where that's just not acceptable. Um, so I ended up not leaving with a... Um, with a prescription for an antidepressant, I ended up with it, leaving with a prescription for lithium, which was good because um, it turns out that this actually wasn't my first rodeo. I'm not going to tell you which one of these people, one of them is me. Um, I was in high school and I was, um, I had, I dealt, dealt with depression and I did get an antidepressant at that time, which is why I just expected this um, to get, go in and get an antidepressant. And I didn't realize at the time that what, when I got skyrocketed into uh, hypomania when I was 16, that that was what was happening. I just thought that that was me getting significantly better very quickly. Um, so I, I was surprised that I got something different, um, but it it turned out to be a good thing because I did get stable faster through it. Um, I always want to emphasize that it really can happen to anyone, and I, I bring this up just because I don't know exactly who is in the audience um, or who is going to listen to this the recording at any point. Uh, I do a lot of talking with NAMI, specifically with their Ending the Silence program here in uh, our local high schools up here in Santa Cruz, California. And the thing that I always like to emphasize is that it really, really can happen to anyone, and I think I'm a perfect example of that. One of the people that I tend to present with a lot has a very different story from me. He, we have the same diagnosis, 
but he had a very troubled childhood from early on. He was in and out of reform schools, potentially having to go to juvenile detention, had issues with drugs, um, really, really rough time in life. But we, but I didn't have any of those. I was the president of the National Honor Society. I got straight A's. I was on the private dance team. I was on the color guard, as you saw the picture there. I was on the swim team. Um, I had that kind of family that if you would have put us in black and white and stuck another girl as me in there, um, this is what my family would have looked like. Um, and it, I, I never had done any drugs or anything like that. So I always want to emphasize that there's not necessarily blame associated with this. And there's usually not blame. There are things that can trigger it. And there's a lot of media. And the reason I always say this again is because there's been a lot of media emphasis um, on the association with marijuana triggering uh, psychosis or manic episodes. And while that is definitely, there's some very strong evidence that that's true, it's not always the case. And so if you happen to have somebody who's a friend who has bipolar disorder, a child who has bipolar disorder, um, or you yourself have bipolar disorder, you didn't necessarily do anything to make it happen. Um, like I said, with me, I had a very happy, very stable, very well-rounded life, and it still happened to me. So even though I got the correct diagnosis finally and um, got some appropriate medications, being on a mood stabilizer first before I was able to be put on an antidepressant, um, it didn't really stop things from coming back. Part of that is because I had my own issues with, um, with the diagnosis. Um, I had con concerns about the drugs. I went on and off medication as people do frequently. Um, the, the fact that there is no blood test to prove that you have something, no scan that can be done, um, and it's all based on witnesses and self-report made me feel like I had led him in the wrong direction. And I went through five different doctors before I accepted the diagnosis. And I did so begrudgingly um, because I had seen that it had had some difficulty in my relationships uh, by not maintaining treatment. And it was causing a lot of, of difficulty long term. Um, so I continued. I got, I got out of the Navy um, in 2004. And I graduated from... Uh, University of Maryland with my bachelor's in physiology and neurobiology, like th I believe it was three weeks exactly after I got out of the Navy, which was one of my proudest moments because it was a goal that I had set for myself uh, when I got my orders to Fort Meade in Maryland and I knew it would be possible for me to go to school. So I was very, very proud of having been able to accomplish that. And I will say that my, my doctor, one of the best things that he told me and that I appreciate to this day is that he was the first person to give me a silver lining to the diagnosis. And that silver lining is he told me that he doesn't think there's any way that I could have been doing what I was doing, uh, which was fighting two wars in a, um, as an Arabic translator and going to school full time in such a hard program um, and doing it successfully. And he said that, you know, he doesn't think that I could have done it without having had the diagnosis. So I was very appreciative of that and am to this day. So whenever I talk to my patients who are, have been newly diagnosed who are struggling with the, what their illness means, um, I always make sure that I do my best to emphasize that because it was so important to me. So as time goes on, I continued working. I was a, I continued on with the translation for the federal government. I worked as a contractor through the Defense Intelligence Agency and a couple of other different three-letter agencies and um, eventually decided that I wanted to pursue what I'd originally intended, which was medical school, and had put on the back burner just because of the the implications of the diagnosis and my fears related to that and the complications that it led to. Um, so I continued to do that for four years, at which point I finally decided that I wanted to um, pursue naturopathic medical school, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but for more, I want to continue on and tell you that, you know, it didn't necessarily stop the medic. The medication didn't stop everything because that happens to people a lot. And so I just want to make sure that I go through that too. Um, so I had, this picture here, none of these pictures are mine, by the way. Most of them have the, the copyright or the information or their source um, that I found them on. I just chose this picture because this sort of felt representative to me of one of my worst manic episodes. Um, I have on the top here that the sky was cracking and the truth was going to be exposed. And that was, I truly believed it. I had um, an, a time where I, I just had so much energy. And I'm sure a lot of you who are listening can relate to this. I just I had so much energy, I couldn't control it. I had to 
I was trying to sit still and do some work and I couldn't and I had to bounce around everywhere. I remember bouncing my dog to the back door to let her outside to go to the bathroom and singing songs about going outside and going out with friends later and bouncing around them in a circle because they were trying to figure out something to do and I couldn't sit still. Um, and then having my some visual perception distortions, I remember in particular driving down the road and realizing I don't, I shouldn't be driving and having to have somebody drive me instead because cars weren't where they should be. I'd gone to the grocery store and couldn't see things exactly where they should be. I was looking right where, particularly where the broccoli should have been and everything was sort of swirling around it. Um, and then I was having these perceptions that I was getting sucked to the top back of the room and then things started to get scary and I had to scratch myself to pull myself back into reality and, and, and then it really started to get to the point that I felt like the sky really was cracking and I could see cracks forming in the sky and everybody who could look, could look at me and see that I wasn't really there and that the truth was coming out and there was no way to hide it anymore and they would all know that I wasn't there and that somehow um, if I kept running, if I kept moving, that I wouldn't die. And I remember getting myself to the gym and running as hard and as fast as I possibly could. And this was, happened to be when I lived in Arizona, so it was um, too hot to just run outside. So at least I had that foresight to not get myself into a really bad medical state on top of my mental state. Um, so fortunately, I had a really, really good doctor at the time, and I was able to call him and reach him. And he's still my doctor to this day. And the this state resolved really, really quickly. But I also did have another time where the thoughts of death came back. And again, I had the same doctor and he was able to resolve it very quickly. But it was scary because I had thought that I'd reached a point that it wasn't going to happen anymore because I was on, I was I'd stuck with my medication treatment. I'd added some naturopathic things and I should be done with this. But it, it came back. Um, so then... Basically what I want to tell you right now before I go on with much more of my story because the rest of my story involves naturopathic medicine because that was the biggest part for me, for my recovery and for the hope that I'm able to offer people. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my professional philosophy though. I want to make sure that I make it very clear that although I'm a naturopathic doctor, I am in no way opposed to conventional medication. I think that it can be a very important part of of a treatment plan. I don't necessarily think that all of them are are meant to be used long term, um, but in emergency circumstances, they definitely save lives. They saved my life one time, but naturopathic medicine also saved my life. So um, I do have a very well-rounded um, belief and system for working with both conventional and natural approaches. Um, my goal is usually to help people either reduce or eliminate their need for medication when possible, but I don't always think that that's possible. For, it's not possible for everybody, and for some people it just doesn't make sense. So for my professional belief and my professional philosophy about health and about medicine is that there is no one answer, and that what needs to happen is the best thing for each individual. Every type of medicine, every approach, to, in my opinion, should be individualized to the, the unique needs of the person. Um, and I'll get into that those specifics a little bit more later. So we'll go back to my story. Like I said, I both loved and hated my medication. It was it kept my mood stable, but it made me feel nothing. And I really mean nothing. I couldn't feel excitement. I couldn't feel love. I couldn't feel sadness. I just felt flat. And when I would talk to my psychiatrist about this, her response was, well, at least you're not manic or suicidal anymore. And I said, well, yeah, that's true, but isn't there more to life than just not being manic or suicidal? I refused and still do refuse to believe that just because you are have a diagnosis of a mental health condition that you should expect to have a life that is less than because of the side effects from medications, and I don't think that that has to be the way. So I, like I said, I went on and off medications. I tried several different types with varying results. Lithium was probably the 
easiest for me just because I had a strong aversion to trying Seroquel or any of the other antipsychotics because I didn't feel like I was psychotic. And at the time, I hadn't had any type of psychotic episode. I came close with that one with um, the uh, delusions that people were going to, the truth was going to be exposed and, and the sky was cracking. But I did actually still know that that wasn't real. Um, so I also loved and hated myself. This was such a, a tough thing, and this was probably the last thing that I had to work through um, to be able to really get to the point that I feel truly recovered from this. And that's that I loved parts of the illness, and I loved all the advantages that it gave me. I'm able to see, or was able to see, the world with so much more vibrance and color and in so many different ways that other people who didn't have the diagnosis that I have uh, can't possibly experience. And it gave me some huge advantages. There were times that I could get so much done and my brain just worked so quickly and connected all of these dots. Um, I, I'm re I think to the TV show that's out with um, Homeland. I always, that, that one's such as close to home because in a lot of ways that, that was kind of like my life for a while. Um, where she ends up connecting all of these pieces, but she's right, and it's just that she's noticed it, but they look, they portray her as if she's incredibly crazy in the way that she does it with um, connecting dots and bright colors and stuff all over the walls. Um, I love that aspect, that ability for me to be able to make those connections and get those that work done, but I also hated that I couldn't do that without that kind of portrayal that she's given in the, in the show. Um, without people looking at me like I'm losing my mind or those times when I'm so, it was so depressed that I couldn't get out of bed and I couldn't think at all. Um, I hated those parts. And then it ended up making me feel in a lot of ways, like I had something I, I had to make up for in every relationship, every friendship, every single aspect of my life. You know, I had to, I went in almost apologetically that I'm sorry that you have to deal with this problem with me, that I have this disorder. Um, my turning point came when I was told by my psychiatrist that if I wanted to have children, my only option for treatment was ECT or shock therapy. I thought that that was a, I thought that was unacceptable because I, I never felt like I was that sick. Nothing had ever gotten in my way so bad that I'd ever lost a job or I'd ended up in prison or had anything serious happen. I, you know, no, no serious issues with drugs or alcohol or you know, huge gambling debts, anything like that, um, any major illnesses from reckless behavior, nothing. So I thought that that was a pretty dramatic response, but then I was also afraid of what would happen if I went off of medications to to have children, which I, I do want to have children someday. So at that point, I happened to meet my naturopathic doctor um, who gave a presentation on uh, his his treatment that he uses for bipolar disorder, and I was ripe for the, the uh, new experience and the new viewpoint because the way I saw it, if something, if something happened, there was, if, and, it, and it didn't work out, there was always the option to go back to ECT um, if that was really what had to happen. Um, fortunately, it was the most powerful medicine that I've ever experienced, and I was able to get off of all of my conventional medications and get to the point that I'm routinely stable without any episodes for over two years now, and it's really um, been amazing. So I'm glad that I had a, I had that opportunity to be exposed to it and have a different viewpoint and be prepared to to shift my thinking a little bit from my very strict science, very you know, structured military type of thinking to a different type of viewpoint. Um, I had to go through a lot of therapy as well for the self-esteem aspect. Um, I had some PTSD-related issues that I had to be talked through, um, and then just some general talking about the my feelings about myself overall. And what really helped me with my turning point was to somehow truly accept and embrace the fact that I have this diagnosis and to ultimately to share my story about it. So I want to thank everybody here for allowing me to share it with them because you are still part of my my turning point with, with my self-esteem. Um, it truly has been really inspirational and pivotal for me to make the decision to share my story. Before, when I was in practice, even though I've been very healthy for years now and don't have any concerns that 
um, I'm going to have any more episodes because my triggers are no longer triggers and I've been exposed to them, um, that it still has been something that I felt like I had to hide because I felt like because of the stigma associated with it that I was going to be judged very harshly and nobody would want to see me as their doctor because they would think that I would be crazy and unreliable and unstable. Um, that's not true. And in fact, I think that in many ways it has made me a much better doctor because I can understand things both from a medical and a clinical perspective, but from a personal perspective, I understand things the way that you can't get from a book. I, you can't really understand and know the fear and the hopelessness and the desperation and the excitement and exhilaration if you haven't experienced it yourself, at least in my opinion. And I say that because there are other um, medical conditions or psychiatric conditions that I can treat and I know that I can treat from a logical perspective and a clinical perspective, but I don't understand it to the same way that I, I understand bipolar disorder. So it really does, has led to my passion and purpose, and that's been really helpful for me to regain my strength in my community, my strength in my my drive for my work, and my volunteerism. Uh, the volunteerism has always been a really important part of my life, and it's helped to keep me grounded and rooted in a community and helped really to keep me feeling connected to things that are greater than me. Um, I'm not a religious person, but I am very connected to the to my community, and that's the way that I do it is through volunteerism. So we'll talk a little bit now about what kind of doctor I really am. So that what I am is a naturopathic doctor, and what that means here in California, we are licensed primary care providers. We go to a four-year medical school. Um, I happen to go to the one that's on the top left, SCNM, the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. Um, it's a four-year graduate level program that we learn the same basic biomedical sciences as your MD or your DO would learn. We also learn the same pharmacology. We focus though on treatments that are natural and that stimulate the body to heal more so than suppress symptoms. We do learn the suppression of the, the, the medications, the pharmacology that is used to suppress or kill symptoms like antibiotics, antipsychotics, that's what I mean by anything that's anti, antidepressant, it's going against depression, it's suppressing it, it's not necessarily stimulating, it's not um, pro-euthymia or stable mood, um, even though that is the end result when you stop taking those medications, often the symptoms return. Um, the The program is, like I said, it's a four-year residential program, so there are people who go to naturopath, or they call themselves naturopaths or traditional naturopaths in some places that did not go to a four-year school. So it's always, if you're considering seeing somebody um, who is in the natural field, um, naturopathic doctors are licensed and went to a four-year program where it was clinical hours, in-person, supervised by MDs, NDs, DOs, chiropractors, etc. Just so you know the difference. Um, so that's what I did for school there. I um, went to SCNM and like the information said, I focused on homeopathy because homeopathy is the type of medicine that I've found to be the most effective. It's what I've used um, and it's been the most powerful thing that I've ever experienced. And so we learned things like homeopathy, nutritional support, which I also use significantly. Um, we learned botanical medicine or herbal medicine. Um, in my school, we learned acupuncture as well, although here in California, we don't do acupuncture as part of our scope of practice. Um, we learn other different things that really do the, a lot of the mind-body connection on, on top of all the pharmaceuticals. So part of my recovery has been um, working with, in, in activism, it's working with things like International Bipolar Foundation, NAMI, Santa Cruz here, um, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, and through the Veterans Affairs. I talk to these groups and work with these groups as much as possible just because I think it's helpful for people to see somebody coming out on the other side and especially somebody who's worked through a lot of odds that would it in a lot of ways seem insurmountable um, based on the, the condition. I also work with the California Naturopathic Doctors Association of which I am the vice president elect. I will be the vice president in starting in March. Um, I'm also the Legislative Committee Chair, and I also work with the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, uh, where I help work with collaboration and liaison with the Veterans Affairs um, Department in Washington, D.C. I do that because I'm actually a disabled veteran as well. I 
was uh, diagnosed while I was in the Navy, which means, and they determined that my service in the military made my condition significantly worse, although they will not take credit for it happening, and I agree with them that it, they didn't make it happen. Um, but my rotating shifts, my long hours, my harsh conditions definitely made it worse. So with getting better, I also have, it's increased my professional dedication to my practice and my, my whole life basically at this point is dedicated to the treatment of those who are suffering with a mental health condition and helping people to live better lives as well as helping to reduce the stigma. So on the professional side, I happen to be practicing at what's called Fountainhead Naturopathic Mental Health Clinic. It's me and two other naturopathic doctors and our entire focus at our clinic is treating people with mental health conditions. We are working with Santa Cruz County up here to establish the first ever mental health coalition to help improve the options and choice and care for people here in Santa Cruz County and hopefully eventually be able to take it throughout California. So my approach is a little bit different um, than what you might be used to. Um, I typically spend a significant amount of time getting to know a patient. Um, I, my first appointment is typically four hours um, where I really get to know the people as a whole person. I get to know my patients inside and out. Um, my approach really does not separate the mental health condition and any other physical conditions. And that's really fundamental to naturopathic medicine overall. Um, we, the brain and the body are connected and the conditions that lead you to having a susceptibility to a mental health condition as well as a susceptibility to a, a physical health condition, they, they're not necessarily separate. So when I talk to my, my patients, I make sure that I really understand their individual unique experience of their mental health concerns as well as all of their physical concerns. So my, my approach is to treat the whole person. Um, and that's part of my method. So my, my basic, it's really simple. Um, however, not it, it's simple in the overall view, not as simple in the, the execution. The approach that I take is to treat the whole person. So like I said, if somebody comes in and they have bipolar disorder, they have migraines and they have constipation, I need to know about all of that because the medicine that will stimulate their body to heal will affect all of those things. Um, removing obstacles is the thing that I focus on the most, and it's um, I'm, anticip I'm, I'm planning on writing a, a series of blogs for the International Bipolar Foundation related to specific obstacles that people can use without, or they can talk to their doctors about if there's um, any concerns about how it might interfere with, with their medications. But for the most part, it's they're pretty simple, and most people, whether they're on medication or not, could benefit from them. And then I use medicine, natural therapies to stimulate the body's innate ability to heal. On occasion, I will refer to a psychiatrist when they need to do um, medication management or if at the time a medication is appropriate. Um, that's not my area of expertise, so I typically refer out to that and then work with, in collaboration with the psychiatrist and therapist to make sure that the, the patient's needs are fully met. So as I mentioned, homeopathy is vital to my approach. I have found that homeopathy is the most effective medicine to gently stimulate the body to heal. I've also found that people typically respond very quickly to homeopathic treatment, as quickly or more so, most often more so than to their conventional medication. Now what homeopathy is, it's a medicine that when you give a single substance found in nature that's prescribed based on the unique characteristic or individualizing symptoms of each individual's case will stimulate the body to heal and it does stimulate the body to heal as a whole person. Um, it does require some accuracy in prescribing because there are thousands of things that we can choose from to prescribe to stimulate healing. So that's where the true expertise in the um, with the selecting of the medicine really comes in. And so just, I couldn't give some advice that, oh, these four remedies would be really helpful for bipolar disorders to so go to Whole Foods and check them out because you could really use any medicine for any condition as long as it fits the particular unique symptoms that somebody has. It's a little bit complicated and I can, I'd be happy to answer questions about it or you can find some more information about it on my clinic website or my personal website. Um, or you can always send me an email or give me a call about that too. I don't have a whole lot of time to go into the details about that right now. Um, I also use supportive therapies. All of the therapies that I use to 
support healing are really basically supporting homeopathy's healing power and supporting what your body does naturally on its own. The way I describe it to a lot of people is that your body is very, very capable of recovering. You get a cold, you're going to get better. Your immune system kicks in and you get better. You get a scratch or a scrape, your immune system kicks in and it gets you get better. Um, the the platelet-forming cascade, everything happens, your body heals. Um, to think that our brain is not capable of also healing is is just it's funny to me and it, it did take me a while to get there too but I've fully accepted because I see it again and again that people really can get better um, when you just give yourself the right basis to be able to do the healing so the supportive therapies are things like making sure thyroid works pro appropriately thyroid is always a big concern with bipolar disorder because um, the, a lot of the medications that we use to treat bipolar disorder are very damaging to the thyroid so not only, though, is that one of the reasons to consider it, we've just found in our experience, and there's been some research related to it, also available on the website, on my website, um, that demonstrates that thyroid medicine itself can actually be a mood stabilizer, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the better functioning a thyroid is, the better any medication will be. And we find that to be true when we see patients who are using conventional medication and they don't really have very many symptoms, sometimes if they just get their thyroid examined and, and treated more effectively, then their symptoms go away and they don't need to see us for any breakthrough symptoms because their medication is working very well for them. Sometimes we even see that with our medication, that we are using homeopathy and any other supportive therapies, but things just aren't quite going as well as we would expect them to. We take a look at the thyroid and we see that it needs some support and then everything starts to work better. So in general, our experience has been that when the thyroid functions optimally, any medication, regardless of what type it is, will work better. We also work with circadian balancing. Basically, the reason we do this is there's um, some viewpoints of bipolar disorder as basically a circadian rhythm disorder. And what we're doing when we use the circadian balancing, whether we use specific lifestyle coaching where we do specific things at certain times of the day routinely just to keep our bodies used to that, um, that really hab habitual type of thing. Um, or we use light and dark therapy. What we're doing is we're amplifying the cues that we would typically get because our bodies are more sensitive to cues or more sensitive to disruptions in those cues. So things that we do is we Focus on exercise. Exercise is a really good mood stabilizer. It's also really good at keeping the circadian rhythm in, um, in check, sort of, if you will. Um, the best time of day that we recommend for people to do exercise that's been shown to be most consistent for mood stability is in the morning. So consistent aerobic activity in the morning is helpful for that cue to keep your body um, on balance and for mood stability. The other thing we talk about is consistent timing of meals. Um, keeping that routine is really so vital in bipolar disorder and also so difficult. Trust me, I know it's it's impossible at times to want to keep that that routine because when your body gets a little bit out of whack and your your brain starts to go in one direction or the other, everything sort of gets messed up along with it. So really being cautious and careful about trying to maintain those the, that rhythm and that routine can be helpful for maintaining um, good and healthy moods. When we use the light and dark therapy, I want to emphasize light and dark therapy. Far too often people will see things in the, the media or the news about light therapy for depression and they, there's not enough emphasis on the fact that bipolar depression is very different than unipolar depression. And the things that work for, bi for unipolar depression could cause significant damage in bipolar depression. Um, that's one reason that I try to write as much as I can about the, the difference in those things so that people don't take medications or natural treatments that are seen to be as innocuous because you can buy them over the counter without a prescription that can actually cause mania and hypomania. Light boxes are one of those things. When we do circadian balancing with light, we always make sure we do dark therapy as well as the light therapy to make sure that we prevent a mania or hypomania from occurring. What those are doing, though, is just really amplifying that signal that we would get normally. That's we nobody really gets the signals as well as we should. Those those of us with bipolar disorder are just more sensitive to those disrupted signals. 
most people these days, I mean, I'm sitting in a room with a light above me, and I woke up today before the sun came up. We're, we're, and I was up late last night making sure that I finished this PowerPoint, that, um, and then I'd reviewed everything to uh, make sure it was accurate before I went to bed, and that was at 9.30 at night, and the lights were on, and that shouldn't have been because it was dark outside. So we're all using these false light and dark times, um, and we're, we're just very sensitive to it. So the, ex, the extra light in the morning and the, the blue blocking or dark therapy at night helps to really overemphasize those cues so that we can get back on a normal rhythm. Um, as far as nutritional support that I will use, I, um, we've got a bipolar diet that we typically suggest to people. All of these things that are these supportive therapies could really be an entire webinar of their own. So I can't go into a lot of detail right now, but these are things that you should consider, the dietary effects. Um, I wrote a blog for the International Bipolar Foundation last month about sugar um, and how it really affects moods and mood instability. So take a look at that. There's some good information on there if you haven't seen it. Um, and I will continue to write more about these types of things and how things affect moods differently for those who have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder in the, the months to come. Um, occasionally I'll use supplements to help people who have um, a significant issue with metabolic syndrome, which can be a problem with a lot of the conventional medications that we use. They cause disruptions in insulin and sugar absorption and they cause weight gain and, and alterations to appetite. So a lot of times I'll work with people to help um, get those things back in check so that they can be more active and generally healthier overall. So that's me and my dog. That's my dog Sadie. We live up here in Santa Cruz and um, we like to go hiking a lot in the redwoods. So these days I'm really, really, as I said, I'm very stable. I have no more concerns or fears that I ha I'm going to have any mood episodes because I haven't for years, despite the fact that I've had significant stressors and things that in the past would have always caused a mood episode, and none of them have. And I've never, and I haven't had any of the episodes or concerns, um, even about the time of year. Um, typically, you know, there's a pattern with spring being a manic time and fall being a depressed time. And while my my energy levels change, the the moods have actually remained stable. So I do make sure that I have an emphasis on eating healthy diet that's well balanced and with an emphasis on lean proteins, organic vegetables, and low sugar. Um, I make sure that I exercise daily as vigorous as I can. That's just me. I happen to need really pretty vigorous exercise to to feel at my absolute best. And I really put an emphasis on sleep. Um, I make sure that I get at least seven hours of sleep, usually more so eight. And in fact, I refuse, if for some reason I have a disruption in my sleep, I refuse to get up early to exercise, even though um, that typically is the time I try to exercise if I get less than six hours of sleep. That's just my own personal rule, because I found that for me, if I get less than six hours of sleep, there's more danger from getting up to exercise than there is from me sleeping in. So you just have to find that balance that works for you. Um, so for you, yourself, or your loved one to live your best life, um, I don't know that I want to make sure we leave time for questions, so I think I'm going to skip over any of these um, specifics. It's just a, the basic thing with remove obstacles, and like I said, I'm going to have some very specific um, individual blogs about removing obstacles for the IBPF um, in the coming weeks and months, so just keep an eye open for those, and there's a lot of information on my clinic website and my personal website um, for things that you can do to remove obstacles, so basically Make sure you get enough sleep. Make sure you're exercising well. Look at the relationships that you've got around you, eating well. Um, and then those other things that we talked about with supportive therapies, circadian balancing, thyroid, those types of things are obstacles. Basically, an obstacle is anything that makes it so that your body does not have the basis of what it needs for functional, healthy living. And if you don't have those basic needs met, if you've got vitamin deficiencies, nutrient deficiencies, um, too much of something, too little of something else, uh, to make the meet the basic needs of life. That's where you, what what is basically we call it an obstacle to healing. So those are the types of things that you can do, no matter what type of medication you're using. Making sure you have those basic needs met are is going to make it work better. And like I said, some of them are really really straightforward and obvious. Others are not quite so obvious, which is why I'm going to make sure that I'm writing about those. So I'd like to go ahead and take the time for any questions that anybody might have. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, first question. 
When you had issues with mania while on medication, were your lithium le levels out of the effective range or were they in range but still ineffective? They were in range but still ineffective. There, I, I can't say that I was completely always 100% perfect about taking my medication because who is? Um, there were some days that I would forget a morning dose or an evening dose. Um, but it was rare that I would go several days at a time, and, or, and it was rare that I would never, that I wouldn't take it at all. Um, so I was routinely checked, and they were within range, and it just wasn't working well enough. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm just having Okay. Questions. Are you a TRICARE provider? If so, does TRICARE approve of this sort of treatment? Uh, I am not a TRICARE provider. Right now, unfortunately, in the state of California, the insurance companies are not required by law to cover naturopathic medicine. So uh, we are working to change that. With Obamacare, there was a non-discrimination clause that was, um, was called Clause 2706, for anybody who's interested in politically minded, um, that was intended to make it so that no licensed provider acting within the scope of their practice could be discriminated against by the insurance companies. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm really doing with the activism in, through the CNDA and the AANP is to make sure that those that clause is actually affected so that people can um, access care, whether it's me, other people, no matter what. I just, that's my biggest emphasis and biggest focus with the legislative action is to make sure that people have access to care and choice in their care. Um, as far as whether or not they approve, I did. Um, I was invited to speak with the VA. Um, for for the um, for a talk about mental health specifically, so I don't know how much it, it, it's sort of an individual provider. My experience with the DoD and VA has really truly been on an, a provider by provider basis. I don't think there's a policy wide um, a policy wide wide approach to anything. I will say though that at the VA there is an, um, a movement toward including all provider types in the centers, and that's headed up by Tracy Gaudet. It's the uh, Office for Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation, and she is 100% in favor of naturopathic doctors. So there is a shift that's happening um, at the federal level. It's just not being seen at the local level as a policy yet. Great, thank you. Next question. I love the idea of doing the naturopathic therapy for my son, but he is currently on many medications. How does he transition from one treatment to another without horrible withdrawals and side effects? That's a very good question. So when people do come to see me and they're already on medication, what I ask is that nothing be changed. Um, I always do a free consult beforehand to make sure that I'm able to help somebody and to make sure that this is the right approach for them because there are some people who want to get off of medication even though it's working very well for them without many side effects um, just for the sake of they have a, a, an issue with the medication itself fundamentally that, that, like I said, I don't have. So I rarely work with those people just because I don't want to put anybody into a crisis. What I do see typically is when people come to see me and they're having some breakthrough symptoms, we can work with that and make sure that improvement is happening and we don't change any of the medications right away. And then I work with a psychiatrist, with their private provider, to make sure that we gradually and slowly reduce medication and continue the, the naturopathic treatment to make sure that they're improving. And we, that way we avoid a crisis and we avoid withdrawals because we do it very, very slowly. Um, and then homeopathic treatment and naturopathic medicine overall can be really helpful and effective for the withdrawal symptoms as well. So it's just a very gradual process that I take. Great, thank you. Do you work with children with bipolar? And if so, can you treat someone out of the area that is in San Diego? Can you refer to anyone in San Diego area that has your same specialty? Um, there isn't, unfortunately, anybody in the San Diego area right now that has the same specialty. Um, I would be happy to have you, if you want to give me a call at my office, my contact information is going to be on the next page. I'll go ahead and put that up in case anybody needs to see it now. Um, give me a call and we can talk about um, what's going on with your child. Yes, I do treat children with bipolar disorder. Um, if you've got quite, we can talk about the specifics, though, to see if we, we might be able to arrange something. I do have patients that are... Um, that don't live here in the local area. So it is possible.
Thank you. Are you taking any, any medications currently? I am not taking any conventional medications. I am still treated with homeopathic medicine, but these days I'm treated for things more like I have back pain or I have a headache or I have a runny nose and or maybe I'm feeling a bit sluggish today. So I have not been on any conventional medications for over five years and I have remained stable um, with even with um, homeopathic treatment. Like I said, I still am treated, but it's not with conventional medications and I've been stable for over two years without any episodes. Thank you. My son has bipolar disorder and is struggling through college. His medications make him very tired all the time, but he's determined to succeed. He is highly intelligent, but has yet to feel confident enough to socialize. Thus, he basically stays in his room most of the time. Um, and he would like a group of friends and a girlfriend. He has an excellent psychiatrist and has been in therapy since 2007. He feels like he needs to be open with people about his bipolar, but the mental illness label scares his, his peers. Any advice? You know, that's a really tough situation, and that's why I'm doing the talks like the one I'm doing right now and the ones I do in other places. I write as much as I can because I'm trying to help people get to a place where they can be more comfortable talking about it. Um, I would be... Advice for him specifically, it would be hard to say. I would need to know more about exactly where he is in his stages of his recovery and how well he's doing. Um, for the most part, my experience has been when I've shared the information with people, it's been not as – I've been frightened about it, um, but it's never been as scary as I thought it would be. And most people were really accepting of it if they didn't already know. Then the reason they didn't know is because it was really not that big of a deal and they realized it. So um, I would – I mean, I would be happy to talk to your son if you would want him to give me a call just so I can see where he's where he's at um, and see if there's anything, any specific advice that I could give him uh, depending on his specific unique situation. I would be happy to talk to him. Great. Thank you. Will you take patients out of state? And if so, how do you manage this type of patient? So I do most of my work with patients um, I ask that most of them come in person for the first visit just because it's a long visit um, to really understand everybody and I'll, the, the full picture. Um, so I do ask that most people come in person for the first visit. On occasion, I will make an exception for that, but it's rare. I do, however, you manage my um, follow-up care very effectively by phone. Even my local patients oftentimes will choose to do their follow-up care by phone. Um, a lot of it is just... Um, helping to coach people through the, the process and reporting and making sure that we have the tools in place that we need them these days with Skype and videos and um, everything, I'm able to really effectively manage long-distance patients. I do have patients all over the country, and even down in Mexico I've got some patients too that are managed very well by phone. Great, thank you. What do you recommend for a pregnant woman who only – has had one episode of mania in her life. She likes to continue medication or would like to continue it during preg pregnancy as she fears she will have another episode. That's, you know, that's a great question. And that's why I found this in the first place for me was because I was worried about that. Um, homeopathy is the most effective and safest medication that you can use for somebody in pregnancy. It, a pregnant woman can use it the entire term of her pregnancy. The conventional side, I would make sure you talk to your psychiatrist about it. There are some medications that are less harmful to a fetus and some that are really very, very harmful to the fetus. So I would talk to your partner and your psychiatrist, and if you have a therapist, your therapist as well, to make that decision. It's a really tough and very individualized decision that you'd, you need to make, um, just based on what you think is the the least risky and the most beneficial, as well as, you know, coming up with some coping mechanisms if you were to decide to not use um, any medication during pregnancy. But like I said, homeopathy and naturopathic medicine is very, very safe during pregnancy, which is why I found it in the first place. Great. Thank you. Do you have an opinion about TMS and its efficacy for treating depression bipolar folks? You know, I don't have a very well-formed opinion about that yet. I'm still doing more research on that, so I would hate to really say anything at this point about it.
Thank you. It seems lithium is generally accepted as an appropriate intervention for bipolar. Are there specific naturopathic interventions to use instead? I'm sorry, what was the first part? I didn't quite catch that. It seems that lithium is generally accepted as an appropriate uh, medication for bipolar. So are there okay. any specific um, and- naturopathic medicines that you recommend? There, so instead of lithium, there isn't something that I would specifically recommend. I do um, encourage people not to switch from lithium carbonate to lithium orotate, which is something that um, is a, there's a lot of literature and a lot of people seem to be thinking that it's less harmful or it's the less toxic form because you can take less. But the studies are not very thorough on it, and the studies that I have read on it suggest that there could be that you have to take less of that because it alters kidney function, which concerns me. So I actually just discourage people using lithium orotate instead of lithium carbonate. Lithium itself is not a terrible medication. Um, so if it's working for somebody, I rarely suggest that they try to do something else instead of it. Great, thank you. My biggest frustration is no one can tell me what triggers my mania. I have gone 17 years between my first episode and second, of which 15 years were off of lithium. Do you work with your patients to determine what triggers their mania or depression? Absolutely. We work, we, we don't do counseling, but we talk in such depth about it. I need to understand when I talk to my patients, I need to understand everything. I need to understand what this specific depression is, not just that you meet the criteria for depression, but everybody experiences depression differently. If we put 10 people in my office right now and they, we all had bipolar disorder, none of our stories would be exactly the same. None of our experiences with it would be exactly the same. So part of my job is really understanding your individual unique experience, and that includes those triggers. Um, in some cases, finding out what those triggers are can help to resolve them, but finding the medicine that helps really relate to that specific trigger and your unique experience helps to make those triggers less problematic too. Any questions? Great, thank you. Have you seen any positive results for individuals that have suffered from long-term disorders, depression, anxiety, et cetera, that are treatment resistant by medicine? or traditional psycho, psychotherapy? Yes, I have. Um, I've seen people who are, they come, they find me, unfortunately at this point, I, my, in my worldview, um, I would think that ideally naturopathic medicine or natural therapies would be first and pharmaceuticals would be second, but because of the current system and the way that it works um, now, usually people find us once they've gone through treatment after treatment and change medications and nothing is quite working well enough for them. So a lot of our patients come to us here at our office who are in that exact situation that they've had years and years and nothing has quite worked and that they've never really felt like they've gotten um, good results from their medication. So unfortunately we see a lot more of that than I would like at this point. Thank you. I have hypoglycemia. Does this affect my bipolar? Oh my gosh, absolutely. That's one of the things that um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of writing to get a lot of this information. Um, hopefully it probably won't be all completed until probably the end of the year, but I've got so many books, like short eBooks that I'm working on that will be available for download on my website. And one of them is about reactive hypoglycemia and bipolar disorder. It's, there's a strong correlation between people who have bipolar disorder and hypoglycemia, the same thing with bipolar disorder and migraines, but there's a very strong correlation of both. And really using dietary interventions to help manage the hypoglycemia tends to make all treatments work better. So hypoglycemia is absolutely related in most cases, not every case, but most cases. Great, thank you. Well, we need to wrap up our session. Um, Dr. Barr has listed her email and her phone number kindly, so I'm sure that she will answer your additional questions that we were not able to get to. I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and thank you, Dr. Barr. Thank you very much for having me, and I will absolutely answer questions if anybody has them. Please feel free to send me an email or give me a call. Thank you.